About two million years ago, a flock of migratory finches travelled hundreds of miles across the Pacific Ocean to settle a volcanic archipelago that we would eventually come to know as the Galapagos Islands. For the vast majority of their history, these islands and their inhabitants went completely unexamined, and it wasn't until 1835 that the Galapagos were visited by a guy called Charles Darwin who you may be familiar with, and who noticed that something strange had happened to that original population of what he called Darwin's finches. Each group of birds had gradually evolved to fill particular ecological niches in accordance with the environment they inhabited, drastically diverging in the process. The large ground finch had a big strong beak for cracking nuts and shells, the woodpecker finch had evolved a small beak and simple tool used to get bugs out of trees, and the vegetarian finch stopped eating meat altogether because there are loads of plants where it lives. There's even the vampire finch which goes through occasional famines, requiring it to drink the blood of other birds. Blech. The question I want to ask though, is that of all these different birds that Darwin discovered, all descended from the same source, which one is the real Galapagos finch? Which one of these birds is the true inheritor to the genetic legacy of the island's original visitors? And which ones are just imitators? Incidentally, you might also be wondering what any of this has to do with video games, and I'll be honest, it's a fair point. See, I want to talk about RPGs. RPGs, or role-playing games, are, as you are no doubt aware, one of the biggest and most enduringly popular genres of game out there, and have been a part of the medium since before video games even existed. Before Mario jumped over his first turtle, before the first Tetronomos were cleared, and before grizzled McShootman blasted his first demon, RPGs were already taking the video gaming world by storm, and they haven't stopped since. The issue is, though, is that RPGs are, in many ways, a victim of their own success. The genre has been so consistently popular, and so consistently widespread, that you could argue that it's begun to have… a bit of an identity crisis. Because, let's be honest, what does a role-playing game even mean? Look at Final Fantasy. Once a venerable series of intellectual, tactical, turn-based games has slowly metamorphosed into an almost purely action series with what would seem like only a surface-level connection to its roots. Final Fantasy XVI's combat system was even designed by the same guy who did Devil May Cry, and the Final Fantasy VII Remake's combat system has basically nothing in common mechanically with the game that it's supposed to be remaking. Over in the West, so many games have started bolting RPG systems onto themselves, with zero regard for the design tradition and expectations they're associated with, that the line between what is and is not a proper RPG has become incredibly blurred. Sure, the new Assassin's Creed games, and Call of Duty, and even Duolingo have gear and stats and experience points, but does that make them RPGs? You'll get a different answer from basically everyone. And in the world of indie games, there are loads of different revivals and remakes and reboots coming out every single day, all of which are claiming to rekindle the golden age of the RPG, and none of which have much in common at all. Roguelikes, immersive sims, tactics games, and whatever's going on here, have very few shared similarities, save for the fact that they all claim to be RPGs, and they all claim to be recapturing a golden age that is mutually incompatible with all the other golden ages. The longer the RPG seems to exist, and the more iterations and mutations it undergoes, the harder and harder it seems to be for fans of the genre, and for the gaming public at large, to agree on what exactly a true, pure RPG is supposed to look like, or even what elements that hypothetical game may contain. When we hear about a racing game or a strategy game, we more or less know what to expect, but the phrase RPG seems to occupy some insane quantum superposition that defies easy categorization and makes everyone very upset indeed. That's where I come in. You see, for a few weeks now, I've been trying to solve the problem, once and for all, of what RPGs are all about. What single underlying factor ties this disparate group of games together into a group that we all feel like ought to exist, but that we can't quite pin down? Unfortunately, this is something that's easier said than done, because a lot of our core assumptions about the nature of the RPG are, to put it lightly, not the full picture. And nowhere is this more clear than in the case of the name. There are no doubt plenty of people in the comments who've already told me that I'm being silly and that RPGs already have a fixed definition. They're role-playing games, they're games about role-playing, right? Well, yes, kind of, but also, it's not quite that simple. Role-playing as we tend to define it, that being freeform improvisational storytelling where you can do whatever you want and where the world and the other characters are expected to react around you, can be a lot of fun. But very few RPGs actually provide this experience, and most don't do it very well. For example, several core canonical RPGs offer very little in the way of immersive customization or narrative agency. 
you can't make Peach anything other than a healer in Mario RPG, and good luck affecting the plot of World of Warcraft. Equally, something like Bioshock wouldn't be any less of an RPG if you stripped out its lame child murder morality system, and Doom wouldn't suddenly become an RPG if you tacked on a choose your own ending bit. Thinking RPGs are all about role-playing is, let's be honest, pretty logical, but sadly, it just doesn't hold up to scrutiny. So if RPGs aren't defined by role-playing, then what are they about? Well, I think in order to find the core identity of the RPG, we need to first look at their original ancestor species that migrated to the land of video games decades ago, and by that, I mean Dungeons & Dragons. D&D is the original RPG. Basically, every single one, video game or otherwise, can trace its origins back to this single er game devised by Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson back in the 70s, and a lot of its elements can still be seen in RPGs today, from character classes to equipment to dungeons to, uh, you, you know, you know, what are those things that live in the dungeons? Uh, oh, Durga, yeah, them. The thing is though, is that while it would be very convenient for Dungeons & Dragons to be a complete blueprint for all subsequent RPGs, D&D, particularly early D&D, was kind of a mess, and made up of a bunch of different conflicting ideas all pulling in different directions that makes it impossible to use as a template for the whole genre. On one hand, its rules were based on the tabletop wargame Chainmail, and as such was all about tactical battles and rolling dice. But on the other, Dungeons & Dragons emphasised much smaller scale gameplay and so opened up the opportunity for more emergent use of abilities and items as well as non-combat solutions to problems, disrupting a pure focus on combat. Equally, the referee, later called the Dungeon Master's increased power, seemed to shunt the game in the direction of more authored, linear narratives. But the inclusion of primitive storytelling systems, like alignment and paladin oaths for players to deal with, gave them a large degree of control over the narrative as well. Far from being just a make-believe game focused on role-playing, or a purely combat-focused game with a distinct style of play in mind, Dungeons & Dragons was this roiling primordial soup of influences and ideas, and its successors pulled from a variety of them as they split off and evolved, including the ones that confusingly decided to keep the name even if they decided not to have anything to do with role-playing. I know, it's confusing. With that said though, while early Dungeons & Dragons might have had no cohesive vision, and frankly may not have been that fun, its weird combination of ideas still managed to create a spark of genius that went on to guarantee not just its success, but the success of every game that followed in D&D's footsteps. Something that was in equal parts strategy and storytelling, mechanical yet personal. And I think the best way to illustrate what that is, is to check out some of D&D's major video game descendants to see if we can spot what element is still common among all of them. The earliest iteration of digital Dungeons & Dragons can be found in mainframe RPGs like The Dungeon, Moria, or simply D&D, &D, most of which were designed to facilitate online play of Dungeons & Dragons. However, no matter how hard the developers tried, and no matter how fun their creations were, they could never quite replicate the same experience of playing in person with the real Dungeon Master. Early computers were great at handling the minutiae of D&D dice rolling, but they weren't so good at creating rich and lifelike environments or a sense of adventure. So that's why the earliest dungeon crawlers, as I'm going to call them, like Wizardry, Ultima and Rogue, all leaned heavily into combat and external rewards, issuing a lot of narrative baggage that no longer fit their design vision. Since then, dungeon crawlers have been all about the fun of fighting ever bigger and tougher baddies and being rewarded with ever better loot and abilities, leveraging up masters in technology in order to increase the depth of their combat systems and the scope of their dungeons, either literal ones or merely dungeon shaped areas. All kinds of dungeon crawlers, from loot acquisition simulators to more classic party-based labyrinth games, use techniques like random item drops, a drip feed of new abilities, and a constant arms race of enemy complexity to force players to be constantly reanalyzing their character build and to really get stuck in coming up with cool new strategies and unconventional synergies in order to stand a chance against whatever the next big challenge is. Hell, even most modern MMOs have their roots in dungeon crawlers thanks to World of Warcraft, which took many design cues from Diablo and has always been pretty much purely focused on combat and progression. You can make the argument World of Warcraft also puts a fair bit of effort into its story, but I think we can all agree it's a secondary concern for Blizzard, and that's putting it lightly. Everything from the gear system to the big complicated talent trees exists to keep you constantly making interesting decisions and then paying them off with a tangible increase in power. 
Dungeon crawlers excel at making every low level decision and every progression milestone feel meaningful because everything is oriented around combat, and often very punitive combat at that. Souls-like games for example, which were inspired by Kingsfield, which was in turn inspired by Ultima, or Darkest Dungeon, which borrows a lot of roguelike DNA, wouldn't be anywhere near as compelling if you didn't have to scratch and claw for every tiny combat advantage and really think about every action in a way that a greater emphasis on freeform gameplay or narrative would only dilute. Speaking of which, dungeon crawlers weren't the only kind of RPG that spun off of text-based D&D implementations. As graphical power increased, and as PC hardware advanced to the point where actual game worlds could be simulated, another branch of games started to emerge that attempted to recapture some of the player-driven, emergent gameplay that dungeon crawlers left behind, but was still an important element of physical Dungeons & Dragons. These games typically get called CRPGs, or computer RPGs, and that's because the technological advances they were based on mostly started on PC and only ever really trickled into less powerful, less flexible consoles. Rather than being focused on raw tactics and resource management, CRPGs offered a much greater focus on problem solving and creatively empowering the player, letting them do stuff like develop non-combat abilities, explore the world in a non-linear fashion, and see their actions reflected in the world beyond heaps of dead goblins. Ultima Underworld, Baldur's Gate and Elder Scrolls Arena, some of the first CRPGs, all made heavy use of open world gameplay and emergent mechanics like using torches to make popcorn in order to create not just a series of combat encounters but a living, breathing world that could be approached in multiple ways and rewarded building a character with a unique set of skills that pursued a unique path through the game. Look at RuneScape for example. It's entirely possible to play that game in a completely non-combat manner, and the game's questing is more or less completely open-ended, rather than dictated primarily by combat level. Immersive sims like Deus Ex, Dishonored, and System Shock could also be said to fall into this group of computer RPGs, with their origins more or less lying in Ultima Underworld. Immersive sims take the gameplay flexibility of their peers and add a more action spin onto things, maintaining the core player empowerment angle, but reducing the emphasis on numbers even more to focus on giving the player an ever-expanding systemic toolset and visible consequences to even the smallest of actions. More modern CRPGs really go all in on this angle of letting the player do whatever they want and feel like the world is their playground. Bethesda's usual fare is massive open worlds filled with cool little activities to do in every direction that make the player feel like the centre of the universe. And slightly more focused CRPGs like, say, Divinity Original Sin allow you to feel like a total genius for solving puzzles and cheesing combat encounters in really clever ways that supersede a more rigid progression system and narrative structure. Of course, that's not to say that RPG innovation was only happening in the West. Far across the Pacific, another letter was getting bolted onto the front of RPG to form an entirely new genre that still shared that same genetic background, that being the JRPG, better known as the Jamiroquai RPG. JRPGs are characterised most distinctly by their much stronger focus on a linear plot structure and limited player agency, more often than not giving you a fixed character with a fixed role of the story and predetermined skills rather than letting you customise your own. Essentially, rather than driving the story, you're just along for the ride, with even JRPGs that have an open world being fairly heavily tied to an intended experience. Final Fantasy XIV's primary gameplay is its mostly single player and completely linear main story quests, and all of its classes have no room for individual variety, being more focused on mechanical execution. All black mages have to balance ice and fire, all sages deal damage and heal at the same time, and all paladins struggle to stay awake. This is in stark opposition to Western RPGs, which often tout much more of an emphasis on customization and self-expression, even in dungeon crawlers. The reason for this is because JRPGs weren't directly inspired by Dungeons & Dragons, which has never been very popular in Japan, but by imported dungeon crawlers like Wizardry, and also because all the big early JRPGs, Dragon Slayer, Final Fantasy, and Dragon Quest, were made by companies that originally specialised in visual novels, establishing a strong focus on both combat and rich, more traditional narratives right from the get-go. Because of this unique blend of story and combat focus, over time, the JRPG evolved to be almost cinematic in nature, with the ambition and scope of their narratives often far eclipsing that of Western RPGs because they rarely had to accommodate for players going to different areas in different orders or making their own decisions. In Persona 5, for example, you can choose whether to use Yusuke in combat or hang out with him outside of it, but you can't make him anything other than a melee damage dealer or alter his character's story in any meaningful way. Equally, in Octopath Traveler, sure, you can do each of the characters' stories in any order you like, but they'll always unfold the same way and they'll always come together for a big, singular, definitive conclusion. In the modern day, 
JRPGs have branched out maybe the most of all RPG varieties, but still retain a much more firm directorial hand than many other RPGs. This unconventional focus is why JRPGs can abandon their mechanical foundation and still retain the same feel. It doesn't matter if a JRPG turns into an action game or a life sim, their biggest design traditions are more structural than they are mechanical, with narrative progression picking up the slack that would ordinarily be left to more organic means of player advancement. Of course, JRPGs aren't the only kind of role-playing games that put story first. Narrative adventure RPGs are just as focused on story, but in a very different way. See. Not all original adaptations of D&D cut out the freeform story stuff to make room for the combat rules. Others went in the complete opposite direction and removed combat entirely because it only got in the way of player narrative agency. These text-based games, like Colossal Cave Adventure, Zork, and others, were the very first narrative adventure games, and are just as much a part of the D&D lineage as Wizardry or Rogue. These narrative RPGs sometimes get rolled in with CRPGs, and there's a fair degree of blur between them, but I think there's merit in highlighting them as a distinct entity, especially given their unique design lineage and overall focus on story freedom over mechanical freedom. Narrative adventure RPGs de-emphasise combat, and while most mainstream ones still have it, the focus is very much on the player's agency within the story, often taking place almost entirely through dialogue and description, with a few bits of exploration, puzzle solving and skill checks thrown in there for good measure. A great example of this will be the games made by Interplay, Black Isle and later Obsidian, who just like many JRPG developers got their start making text based story games and so carried that narrative focus and experience into stuff like Fallout and Planescape Torment. As a small aside, this is also why the Fallout games made by Bethesda and the ones made by Interplay and later Obsidian have a totally different feel and gameplay style, even if they were made using the same tools, assets and intellectual property. Narrative adventure games, despite a fairly persistent lack of popularity, are the RPGs that I think best embody the role-playing, improv storytelling spirit of D&D. And this can, to varying degrees of success, be seen today in the works of CD Projekt Red and Bioware, both of whom initially got started working for Interplay, and have since thrived bringing narrative agency and strong stories back to mainstream western RPGs after everybody else kind of went out of business. Equally, that's not to discount smaller studios, which don't have the budget for cinematic adventures or super deep combat simulations. Studios like Fail Better or Inkle have thrived in this particular niche for years, and without them, we never would have gotten the recent indie revival of these kinds of games. Disco Elysium, Pentiment, and Suzerain, which all put player narrative agency above all else, are finally showing that they don't need combat and loads of maths to be great RPGs, an idea that stymied even great narrative RPGs like Planescape Torment, where fighting stuff basically only got in the way. RPGs are wildly varied. They come in a million different forms, with some of them having very little in common mechanically with Dungeons and Dragons. But in spite of that, they're all still RPGs. The thing that links all of these very different tiles together isn't a single set of mechanics, design goals, or setting elements, but the far more fundamental focus on the thing that made D&D work in the first place. And that is an emphasis on character. RPGs, more so than any other kind of game, are all about getting you to care about your character or characters and the way that they can change or progress over time. Whether you care about their evolving combat power, their ability to manipulate the world, their personal journey or the consequences of their actions, this through line of being put in control of a little guy, or sometimes several little guys, and gradually nurturing them as you play, is a common factor among all RPGs. Even the role-playing activity that gives the genre its name, where you get to create a character from scratch and define who they are, is just one of many ways to tap into this fundamental appeal. The RPG as a genre has done nothing but evolve and branch out ever since its creation almost 50 years ago, but I believe this core element of character can be seen in all of them, even in the ones that don't really fit into my weird little model. Bioware's stuff, for example, treads the line between CRPG and narrative RPG, having gradually slid from one design school to the other over the years. But even when they're making bad games, and my god have they done a lot of that recently, the studio's focus on caring about characters is still a clear, guiding design principle. 
Pokemon, the world's biggest RPG ever, is a departure from many JRPG tropes, but even though it offers the player much more freedom than in other Japanese RPGs, you can still find the same fun of assembling and growing your little team of guys in both it and more traditional games like the Trails series, which can trace its development history all the way back to Dragon Slayer. And beyond single titles, life sim games like Harvest Moon, Crusader Kings, and The Sims which is a, a pretty eclectic mix to say the least, are well on their way to forming an entirely unique branch of RPGs in of themselves that I will then have to add to my little graph. Hell, even D&D itself is still mutating and evolving over time. The 3rd edition was an open-ended systemic playground, where actually fighting enemies was pretty pointless, which a lot of people hated. 4th edition stripped everything out that wasn't combat and turned itself back into a war game, which a lot of people hated. And 5th edition puts way more emphasis on character backstory and narrative elements than its peers, at the expense of combat balance, which, guess what? a lot of people hate it. But in spite of the fact that D&D has always been pulled between several design influences, the key to the game's enduring success is that its developers never lost sight of what makes the game work, characters were invested in, and care about developing. Equally, when it comes to the recent spate of other games that have lifted RPG mechanics, the ones that successfully tap into the investment and depth the genre is known for are the ones that carry over not just stats and gear, but this focus on character as a core element. Looty shooty games like Destiny realise that getting to make choices about what your character does and constantly creating the feeling of getting stronger is a great way to foster a sense of long term investment in an otherwise faceless shooter protagonist. Strategy games like Fire Emblem, Final Fantasy Tactics, or XCOM have enriched their tactical battling by adding long term character stakes that turn faceless suicide jumps into actual people you're invested in keeping alive. And even stuff like Metroidvanias use RPG ideas in order to double down on that genre's focus on mastery of a physical space by manifesting that abstract feeling in the form of tangible character strength too. Just like how Darwin's Finches started from a single common ancestor and branched out into an array of unpredictable new forms, it can be hard to see from a surface level that some RPGs are related at all. But if you look a bit closer, you can see that, fundamentally, the genetics are pretty damn similar and they all function in more or less the same way, with each species just being a specialised manifestation of their shared original ancestor, which was itself an adaptationary offshoot of another, much older group. There is no true Galapagos Finch, or true RPG, they all have equal claim, and they always have done. So what does this all mean? If RPGs aren't role playing games and never have been, and are actually this weird middle ground between the expressive nature of storytelling and the long term investment of strategy, are they doing fine after all and doesn't that mean we probably need to change the name? Well, I'd certainly say yes to the first bit. I think RPGs are healthier than ever. Just as the Galapagos finches changed shape and diverged over time, the adaptations and genetic history that brought them there never went away, and the same goes for the RPG. Just because the genre is constantly adapting to new environments, doesn't mean that it's dying, and there's always room for throwbacks and revivals to reassert themselves should a favourable niche emerge. And as for the name of the genre, what if I told you that the so called Galapagos Finches weren't actually finches at all? Yep, Darwin was wrong, that ancient ancestor species was actually more closely related to the Tanager and don't have that much in common with finches at all. But we still call them finches anyway, because a name is much more than a description, it represents a history and context that goes beyond mere definition. Just as the name role playing game reflects an incredibly complicated cultural lineage and decades of evolution, even if it's not particularly accurate. The real takeaway here isn't that I've solved the RPG forever, or even that it's possible to do so. Merely the genre, much like genetics, is complicated and in constant motion. We can't pin down and box in the RPG any more than we can stop birds from evolving, and it's only by understanding the messy, indistinct, primordial place they came from that we can truly understand where they're going. Well, it's, it's either that. Or the takeaway is that evolution is a lie, and that Gary Gargax created Dungeons and Dragons, a perfect game, fully formed in six glorious days, and then on the seventh day he rested to get all of his spell slots back. Uh, it's definitely one of those two things, though. Hello, hello, and welcome to the after the video segment for this bumper length episode. Wow, this was. Whew, this was a long one, wasn't it? Anyway, this is part of every video where I sit down backwards on my chair like a cool youth pastor and talk to you about some cool stuff that you need to be made aware of. But unlike a cool youth pastor, 
I'm not talking about Jesus. I'm actually talking about some cool people on the internet. The first of which I'd like to mention is the Great Moon Channel, a YouTuber with a unique specialisation in both lore and Japanese RPGs. And this has led to the creation of some absolutely great and extremely detailed videos on topics that I didn't even realise I wanted to know more about. Mooney has some great stuff on the whys and history of Nintendo being very aggressive with their copyrights, all the way over to the unaccountably fascinating cultural context of why every single JRPG makes you kill God. Uh, seriously, that one's really worth a watch, it's probably my favourite. Moon Channel's videos strike a great balance between being sort of wholesome and relaxing without being too saccharine, and intellectual without being overly dry and boring. They're a great binge watch, please check them out. Also, that's not the only cool person I need to discuss, far from it. I also need to shout out my dedicated patrons who ensured that I can indulgently add an extra five minutes to this video because there was just so much to talk about. Arrgh! They are absolutely great and every single penny they throw my way goes towards ensuring I don't have to make the videos worse for sponsorships or torpedo my credibility by talking about Raid Shadow Legends. In return, they get early access to videos, some special behind the scenes looks where I break down every single video and why I hate it, bonus game design goodness, and even special shout outs like you can see in the corner of your screen right there. Yep, there they go and they're finished now. Or are they? Because $10 donos get the greatest privilege of all and that is to have their names read out by me at the very end as an extra special thank you. And those people are Ali Wright, Andrew Lebrano, Asaran, Alno94, Brennan Spaulding, Brian Latariani, Buy More Skyrim for Todd, Constantin Amend, Cosmix360, Daniel Metjes, Das Kangaroo, David Setzer, Dirk Jan Karambeld, Digletier, Ecton, Edward Franklin Woods, Eugene Bulkin, Gaskell, IOFer93, ISAW Dano, Jacob Dylan Riddle, Jink Lloyd, John Garley A, Jordan Gear, Kevin Help Us, Luke Kokoran, Mace Winter 54, Manuki, Marika Vladalina Altair, Mark Vallant, Nate Graff, NWDD, Oliver Marhofer, Patrick Romberg, Peter D. Tomasak, Redadex, Regal Regex, Ray's Dad, Sheldon Hearn, Simon Jacobson, Steve Riley, Ty Guren, Tyler Duncan, Uprising, Whimsical Wisp, Zach Brandmeyer, and Chow. Okay, that's it. That's that's all from me. I won't keep you any further. Uh, bye.